painting behind us as this continuum of heads interlocking infinitely in all directions because that points to being as a continuum, as a network, in a sense, uh, to an infinite realm. And this is a part of the deep fabric of our being, I think, because we sense ourselves as souls related to many. There is this everyday world, but you can be in a place where there is no you and still perceive the world. That scared me. L losing my ego was the scariest thing I ever, and I still don't like it. A profound state which may be reached uh, by use of these entheogens, psychedelics, hallucinogens, whatever you're going to call them, uh, which is known as ego loss or ego death. Unfortunately, um, subsequent to the coinage of this term, ego has come to be used in a completely other sense. It has been used in the sense of pride, and that is not what ego death is about. Ego death would mean you lose your sense of I for good, and that's not what happens. They mean a temporary uh, suspension of the ego, and when ego death is spoken of. Ego death means the death of you as a concept, whereas we walk around thinking of ourselves as things. We think of, I am sitting in the chair, therefore, you know, I am a thing, the chair is a thing. When we reach the realm of ego death, or ego dissolution, or whatever you're going to call it, there is no longer any perceived boundary between oneself and the chair. In this state, there are no things. There is just one continuous experience. In some sense, all of experience is an illusion. You know, everything that we experience in the here and now in our state of being is a hallucination an elaborate hallucination that our brains construct, we happen to call it consensus reality. But it's still, I mean, I mean physics tells us that, you know, the, the picture of reality that we build so that we can navigate through the world and not step in front of buses and stuff like that and do all those, uh, you know, the world doesn't really look like this at all. You know, the, the brain constructs a model of reality that more or less maps onto reality. It's good enough that we can survive. But we're focused in a kind of, uh, you know, constricted dimensional awareness of reality. And, you know, for safety reasons mostly, you know, and we don't necessarily want to know that we are actual one consciousness with all beings and things at all times. So, nevertheless, those dimensions are all open to our being. You know, we have a complete freedom of the continuum of being. If we change the nature, you know, we have the model and we have the real world out here and we have the sensory neural interface that's taking this information in, interpreting it, and giving us the model. If we change the nature of the sensory neural interface a, a little or a lot, if we substitute, say, DMT for serotonin, you know, the model of the world that we get changes radically. And who's to say that that's any less valid than the model that, you know, the brain constructs for, uh, you know, for everyday purposes? So this idea that, you know, I mean, it's, it's all illusion, it's all hallucination. That's what experience is, you know. I mean, that's why, in some ways, I sometimes get a little impatient with, with people that say, you know, well, a drug experience cannot possibly have any spiritual validity. Well, I'm here to tell you that all experience is a drug experience. You know, we're all on drugs all the time. 
largely because we're made of drugs, you know, and that's what drives us, you know, experience is, you know, sort of the, the, what issues out of this biochemical process of, you know, all these neurotransmitters and hormones moving around our brain, I mean, it's drugs. What is a psychotropic drug? Basically, it's any compound, any chemical that imitates a neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter is the chemistry by which neurons interact. And the reason psychotropic drugs work is because they imitate the functions of those transmitters, but they go beyond that such that they stimulate certain areas more than normal. Consciousness is a closed loop. We have all this information going up into the cortex, but really, if we think at it quantitatively, only about 20% of the input to our, cor our cortex is sensory. All the rest of it is talk or interactions between those neurons, which means that consciousness is a closed loop, and sensory input is just a minor, minor modification. Consciousness is actually created by this loop that is activated once every approximately 20 milliseconds with a phase modulation of about 12 milliseconds. That means if we change the neural chemistry within the cortices, we change the way you experience the world, we change your consciousness. So when we talk about psychedelics and psychotropic compounds influencing consciousness, remember one important thing. Again, to reiterate, structure dictates function. So the reason psychedelic drugs have an effect is because they indicate the brain's own chemistry. All of us have the capacity to make these compounds or they wouldn't be effective. Some of us make more of these compounds than others and we have different altered states all the time. And the fourth and most important feature is that anyone who can control consciousness, no matter who it may be, individual, political, group, can control consciousness by drugs, either illicit or condoned, control the population because they control the sense of self. I think when we get to a point where we can actually do some of these studies, brain scans of people who are having these experiences, we'll be able to start addressing this explanatory gap in terms of sort of the mechanics of how the brain works for what produces these subjective states of feeling and consciousness. And that's the big piece that's missing right now. I think certainly it's possible to take different types of psychoactive drugs that we know have a particular mechanistic function. They interact with a certain receptor in a certain part of the brain and do brain scans and look at that part of the brain light up after that drug is administered and then to be able to use subjective questionnaires and feelings to actually begin to start mapping brain states as a function of brain chemistry. Uh, that to me is actually a, a really um, important goal that no one I think is really clearly articulated but I think we're almost to the point where we could use a library of various types of psychoactive drugs and coupled with uh, advanced brain imaging techniques to actually start mapping a sort of cartography between what happens when a particular receptor in a particular brain area is activated what brain state does that produce what kind of feeling does that produce and I think we're not too far away I think the biggest hold up is sort of social perceptions that is this something we should do and should it be funded as a public priority. You know, I'm a physician and uh, I find that for the serious public health issues of our time that we're impotent, our medicines are impotent and with ayahuasca I had discovered for the first time a medicine worthy of its name, capital M medicine. And as you know, ayahuasca is considered the medicine by many of the indigenous peoples of, of the